So last week, last week um, I posed some questions in the message. I posed some questions in, in the sermon notes. This, these questions, those notes, were driven by Haggai's challenge to the, to the Israelites when, when they were instructed to consider their ways or consider what their hearts were set on. Last week I provided a, a graphic of a, of a heart in different um, fractions. I had a heart that was a quarter, a heart that was a half a heart, a, a three-quarter heart, and a whole heart. And the challenge was to rate the fraction, your heart, of your heart that was devoted to God. I'm kind of curious. I haven't heard anything from any of you, but I wondered how that went. I did ask in the course, or did state in the course of that insert last week, that this was for your eyes only, but every once in a while, someone wants to share their heart. I wondered how that went for you. And if it is something you'd like to discuss, give me an email, give me a phone call, we can talk about it. I wondered if you were able to discern where God is with regards to the devotion of your heart. It, it's not an easy thing to do. That is to gauge where our hearts are in relationship to God. But I propose it is necessary to reflect on the desires of our hearts before, well, before we end up committing some unethical or even some illegal deeds, whether we are church members or uh, in, in the companies we work for or in our communities. You know, I don't want you to scratch in your head and say, how the heck did I end up here? we periodically need to gauge what our hearts are devoted to. I practiced what I preached. Not that that's a new thing for me to practice what I preach, but last week after sharing that challenge to you, I reflected on, and, and with my wife, I reflected on some of our heart's desires. Now, some of these are personal. And therefore, it may be considered by some to be selfish. But we are understanding this is where our hearts are at this point in our life, at this season in our life. It is our heart's desire that we have healthy twin grandchildren who will be born close to term. We realize that is a part that is a peace that is claiming our heart. The health of, of twin grandchildren that we anticipate might be the end of August, might be the middle of September. We certainly wouldn't want it to be any sooner than the end of August. Janet and I considered a part of our heart is as we come into this season in our life, 60 plus, the desire for a home that we can call our own as we prepare for the next season in our life, which leads me to the third piece that we identified, and that is that we would have good health leading into retirement and through retirement. And lastly, the desire for the courage to expand the kingdom of heaven on earth. Maybe it's at this point in my life, 60 plus, when I begin to wonder, you know what, this legacy thing starts to play a bigger role in your mind and in your heart and in your soul. And mine is not to get to the biggest church that I can be in, but to help expand the kingdom of heaven on earth. A couple of these I said are personal. Maybe selfish, I confess. But I'm wondering what your heart is devoted toward. I feel a need, um, as we go into this service, I feel the need to refresh some thoughts that I shared last week in this portion I call the opening conversation. And, and one of those thoughts that I shared last week 
is that single-minded living comes from wholehearted devotion. If our heart isn't all in, we will be destined to discouragement, burnout, and freak out when facing obstacles. Those are lessons that came from reflecting and praying on the context of Haggai and on his message. Remember, the prophet Haggai is challenging God's people, not just the people of 500-something B.C., but God's people today in the 21st century. That's you, that's me, that's us, challenging us to live with courage, even in the face of discouragement. And today, today we rethink what it looks like to live with courage in the face of discouragement and yet take action. Taking action is the call and the focus of today's message. Living with courage leads toward action. And so let's listen as Conrad Olson reads for us the passages today from the Old Testament prophet Haggai as he addressed those people of that generation and now addresses us. Listen to the word of God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. In this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. On the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Asks the priest what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priests answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of twenty measures, there were only ten. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were only twenty. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. So I've had these thoughts as we go along the way of following the Christ into the world, as we as God's people live into um, expanding the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And these thoughts have to do with courage because I think that is a part of the challenge that Haggai has instilled within God's people of long ago. I teased last week that a mindset was creeping into the way of the Israelites. 
that they were approaching the task God put before them. Let me restate that. There was a mindset creeping into the way the Israelites were approaching the task. The task, again, was the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And we looked at, at, at behavior that leads to discouragement. Today I want to address some potentially destructive ways of thinking that may keep us from acting at all. And so, first of all, I want to compliment to the behavior that is healthy, that I have seen, that I, that I interpret from the scriptures. And the healthy behavior is that the Israelites did consider their ways and they prioritized their days. They did the next right thing and they obeyed God. And despite the demand, despite the desires and the distractions of their daily lives, they followed their calling and they began rebuilding the temple. The three weeks it took to clear the rubble and then they began to build up the walls. Now one might think that it's all good. Well, it was for a bit. And then, <laughs> and then it wasn't. I remind you the first temple was, was built by um, Solomon, David's son. It was grand, not only in scale, but in the amenities that were found within the walls of the temple. Now you can read about the grandeur of the first temple in 1 Kings and it's through chapters um, 5 and 8, between 5, 6, 7, and 8, gives you a sense of, of, of the grandeur of the temple. The people of God were so proud of this temple, and they were so devastated when it was destroyed as they were being carried off by the Babylonians into exile. I talked about that put that into some context in the first week. They were devastated when they watched the temple that was so grand, they were devastated to see that it was destroyed, which needs to be understood because now, now the second temple is beginning to take shape. And I shared last week that within three weeks of choosing not to not focus on themselves and to focus on God, how the rubble was, 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 was removed and the, and the temple foundation was cleared and they began going to town. But then, a group within the Israelites, a group of um, older Israelites, they became discouraged. And with all due respect, the senior citizens of this generation had, had seen the size and the grandeur of the first temple before being dragged off into exile. They had seen it. They had been a part of it. They, 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 they weren't a part of the building, but they certainly were a part of the experience of going into this temple. They were now comparing the new temple to the first temple. The second temple was built on a smaller scale with uh, admittedly a smaller budget. And in their hearts, the senior citizens of the Israelites, in their hearts, there was no comparison at all. Now, it's that mindset that I feel a need um, to to highlight because it's that mindset what I call a comparison trap that can keep us from living with courage. It can keep us from taking action. So comparison is a trap and my proposal this week is that it takes courage to avoid that trap. It takes awareness to avoid that trap. But now, hear me again. We sometimes have the same tendencies to compare, um, just like the older, 
the senior citizen Israelites compare? We look back. We look back and we compare today to yesterday. We compare how we think things should be to how they actually are. We compare our Christmas gifts with the Christmas gifts of our, of our cousins, of our siblings, of our neighbors, of our coworkers. Da, 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 da. We compare. We compare our vehicle to what others drive. We compare our homes with the homes in our neighborhood or the homes that we see on television. We even compare our church with other churches. Why they do this there and they do that there and but we don't do that here, why not? We compare and the outcome, the outcome, we can end up feeling like nobody with nothing. What are some ways you compare yourself with others? Regardless of our season in life, I think it happens. Have you ever visited someone's grand and beautiful home and then walked back into your own home and suffered from the comparison trap? Have you ever compared your home to what you just watched on HGTV and your home seems to be like a, a shack in comparison? But in reality, your home isn't a shack. It's just not the same as the one you saw on HGTV or the, wish, or the one you wish you had, like the one in HGTV. You get the idea about this comparison thing? Take a look at the sermon notes and reflect on how we are affected, how we are drawn into the comparison trap. There again, I'd love to hear some of your responses and how you deal with that, how you are intentional about avoiding that trap. I can always use the suggestions myself. Back to B.C., 500 B.C. or so. Was the temple really nothing? No. It was something. Something that would become a dwelling place for God. Something that would renew, that was a part of the renewal of the covenant God desired to renew with the people. The Israelites were discouraged and, and weepy because they compared the past to the present. They looked at what God did then and compared to what God is doing now. And from my point of view, well, I conclude God's people were, were using the wrong measuring stick to compare. Ever happened to you? <laughs> using the wrong measuring stick? I think it happens to all of us. The danger I propose to comparing is that we miss what God is doing in our midst. We, we miss what God is doing in the present. Again, I can't argue. Historically, it is correct that the second temple was not as outwardly impressive, impressive as the first. However, we will learn that the second temple will have greater glory that we are not able to see in the present. How so? Well, the second temple will be the temple of Jesus' day. The temple Jesus was brought to to learn and later to teach. That's the temple that is being rebuilt right now by the people that Haggai is addressing. 
And so God declares that the temple will end up being greater than the great temple the older, weeping, senior citizen Israelites were remembering. God's putting it into a new perspective. God's putting it into a new context. And so I have learned that I cannot always see the full potential of something while I am in the middle of that something, of that experience in my life, of that season in my life, of that, of that grief in my life. I am not able to see what God is doing and where that will lead because I'm in the midst and it's that comparison thing, that, that, that trap that ends up discouraging me and possibly you because I compare and I see the wrong things, the unhealthy things. I hope you don't do that. What if? What if instead of comparing... We look for what God has promised to do. We look at our, with our wholehearted devotion and live obedient, obediently to God's will rather than comparing all around us. I conclude the result will be courage over comparison. And that courage will lead us to take action. Hopefully I can make some more sense of this. What could life look like if we saw the world clearer or more clearly through God's eyes rather than the foggy lenses of comparison? I think we'd see many more possibilities than we currently do. I could offer several more behaviors that to avoid, I should say, several um, more behaviors that to avoid in order to live with courage and in order to take action. But I want to offer just one more, just one more behavior that most, that prevents most people from taking action. And that behavior is fear. That emotion, that behavior, I'm, I'm calling it a behavior. I am drawn back into verse 5. Now, I know that wasn't read for us today. We started with verse 6, but I'm going to draw back into verse 5 to put this into some context. And verse 5 reads this, this is what I coveted, coveted, this is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. So when I read this, I conclude that God is, is reminding the weepy senior citizen Israelites that the promise, that the covenant made with Moses and the people still stands. It is, it is still valid. There was no expiration date on God's covenant. God's spirit was with them then, and therefore they had no reason to fear. And God's spirit is with them now, and so they have no reason to fear. Of all the words, of all the words that God could have told them, why did God tell them not to be afraid? Well, have you ever been gripped by fear? I have. Don't we all from time to time? I think so. Fear can paralyze Fear keeps us from moving. Fear keeps us from thinking straight. Fear keeps us from living with courage. I think God was making some long-standing connections with the Israelites as he states, 
I was with you back in Egypt, way back in the wilderness, and I am with you now. My spirit is with you, and where I am, there is love, and where there is love, there is no fear. If we make that leap into the New Testament, fear is real. When opposition arises, when disappointment grows, when discouragement spikes, when hope fades, when weariness sets in. My question in light of this, these comments is where is fear gripping you in your life right now? Where have you been paralyzed right now? Finances? Are they causing you fear? Relationships? Your health? These are just some of the things that came to my mind as I was, as I was sorting through what any one of us might be experiencing. What? Where is the fear gripping you in your life right now? I propose that God calls out in each of these situations, not only the ones that I named, but all those that you can name, regardless of that which grips you and causes you fear, God is calling out in these situations and so many more, do not fear. I hope you can hear that. Do not fear. Haggai reassures God's people that God's spirit remained with them and God promises to never leave them or us. Matthew 28, verse 20. Very end of what Jesus has been about in the Gospel of Matthew. The last words Jesus speaks... And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That was reason Jesus was giving his disciples to, new, to not fear, to not fear as he departs. I need, and maybe you need, to practice the presence of God so as to, to remind us to remember that God is present with us and that we need not fear. That is, to practice the presence of God, to grow in the awareness of God's grace, to grow in the awareness of God's promises, to grow in the awareness of God's steadfast love. I mentioned earlier in, the CZ, C, in this series how easy it is to get distracted, how easy it is to misplace God's priorities and get caught up in the comparisons and, and thus lose, lose a sense of God's presence. Fear can interrupt our sense of God's presence. When plagued with fear, it is best to practice God's presence. For me, my go-to's to read the scriptures. I have, I have a verse, commit your way to the Lord, trust him, and he will act. I sometimes do that as a breath prayer. And so first it is to read the scripture, to recite the scripture, to internalize the scripture. And secondly, it is to pray. Those are my go-tos. Read scripture and pray. And sometimes I pray the scriptures. How do you practice God's presence? If that's a term that is new to you, to practice God's presence, <laughs> well, I could take 20 minutes and explain it to you, or I can simply say, Google it. Google Brother Lawrence. 
I've found that practicing God's presence is attributed to this faithful servant. And you can learn more from Brother Lawrence. This practicing the presence, I believe, I believe applies to individuals and communities of faith so that we do not let fear keep us from living with courage and taking action. I believe each person listening can become a fresh experience, a fresh expression of God's transforming presence in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our world. Haggai teaches that such a fresh expression can be if, if we stop comparing ourselves with our neighbors, that we stop comparing, comparing the present with the past. We can be that fresh expression when we take action and therefore when we stop being afraid. Those are the two things. There are others, but those, in my mind as I read through this, those seem to be the ones, the behaviors that keep us from taking action, that, that prevent us from going forward in courage. I've shared some, some sermon notes uh, in the handout, um, and I ask, in, in what way do you need courage in your life at this moment, today? I give you an exercise, an exercise that might you might find helpful. I'll leave that for you to read. I wonder, what are some of the ways you compare yourself with others? By the amount of hair? By the size of your body? By the size of your bank account? I don't know. There's a lot of comparisons. There is a pretty significant comparison trap that seems to be affecting a lot of people. Again, I will always love to hear from you if you want to share some of those thoughts. If we want to dialogue about something that you do not entirely embrace, that you do not entirely agree with, if there's something more, something more that you want to know about regarding Haggai and how he was challenging the people of God, I would love to engage with you. But Haggai says we can be a fresh expression when we stop comparing ourselves with our neighbors or the present with the past and when we stop being afraid.